Hello, hello, hello again. Mohamed, Carlos, Pablo, Yana, please turn on your cameras and show uh, yourself to our wonderful WC community. We're here today to talk how uh, an insight by our amazing speakers today has inspired them to take action and create impact. And that's what the IX3 stands for. Insight, uh, inspiration, and impact. And WSC um, has been discovering and awarding and acknowledging the social entrepreneurs who are making the impact for the last 20 years in uh, solving local issues uh, that they see and they employ technology to, to basically ad uh, address the issues that they see. Um, if you don't know yet what WSA is, I highly encourage you to go online and check it out. Uh, it's definitely to, worth exploring the winners over the last 20 years who have created such an amazing impact. But without further ado, today we are here to, to hear stories from across the world, from three very different places, and from three very, very different uh, companies who saw a problem in the local community and decided to do something about it. So before, without further ado, Mohammed, I would like to invite you to share your story and how you found Brefayo and how you are changing the world uh, with your uh, impact. Thank you, Odetta. Um, and my name is Mohammed Bilal. Um, I'm founder of Breathe.io. So I would just simply go back to the story. Let's not get everybody bored on that. So it just went back. Uh, it's uh, Let's go back somewhere in 2014, 2015. That's uh, where it all starts. So just to express my background, I'm a postgraduate in artificial intelligence and machine learning from the University of Texas, Austin. Uh, then I've got my MS uh, in computer science, bachelor's, and then uh, one load of certifications and so on and so forth. You can Google me on LinkedIn. And so that can be much more uh, easier for everybody to figure me out. So uh, being part uh, uh, of this technology spectrum, um, I've been running my own uh, software house for almost a decade. So that's 10 years of uh, development experience over there. But uh, it went back right in 2015 when uh, uh, I was uh, trying to help a hospital in Pakistan. It's a children's hospital right over there. And within the Pakistani community, um, these are government-supported hospitals uh, which uh, constantly need development. All these uh, non-profits that help and sustain these uh, communities right over there. So the, ch the children's hospital, what I was working on was uh, trying to set up an, uh, an ERP, a small data management tool right over there. And I think helping non-profits is a perfect way to just get a spectrum of what the work is over there. Although it was just, uh, how would you say it? I would say it was a marketing aspect towards me. You know, once you help nonprofits, you get notified uh, by others as well. And then it adds up uh, to the portfolio as well. So here we have, where we are, 2015, we were organizing their data and the winter comes in. And you know what happens usually uh, in a mid terrain, it's, it's like a straight terrain uh, in the city of Lahore. Uh, when the winter comes in, the humidity gets condensed and then we have fog everywhere and fog is beautiful you know it's, it's the perfect candid shots because when there's fog light gets diffused you get the perfect blend of photography right over there but when the fog comes in this time it's different i go out with my camera and uh, what i smell is there's a smell of diesel in it and i'm like okay that's different maybe it's something going on but the whole winter it was right over there and that smell of diesel projected it into our data that we were having it in the general's hospital because it was a database of the patients that were coming in. So usually what happens is in the winter times or all year long, either the issues that the children were facing before that uh, diesel smelling fog came in, that was mostly gastro problems like uh, uh, stomach ulcers and so on and so forth. But instantly now, you know, children are highly uh, influenced by the environment and they're very sensitive to it. What I see in the data is that children are coming up with throat infections, uh, bronchitis, chest congestions. And that's really uh, interesting. And the other thing that happened in that same year worldwide was there was a Paris Accord that was being signed for climate change at that time. 
So there's a really correlation, right, going over there. Anyways, the year went by in 2016. The next year, now we've got the same data, we're analyzing it. And now we're getting uh, elderly people above 60 coming up with the same problems. And that's it. You have a problem over here. And what the problem is, it's air pollution. And as of now, World Health Organization states 90% of the world population, that's 7 billion people, the world population is standing at 8 billion people, are living under air quality conditions which do not meet the guidelines of WHO. That is resulting in 8 million deaths a year. That's more than uh, HIV, AIDS or anything like that. 8 million deaths just because of bad air quality. So moving forward, I keep observing, I keep observing, I keep observing. I'm expecting that somebody would come up with a solution to it. But you know, as humanity, we have a perfect way of identifying a problem, putting fingers, yet nobody tends to solve it. You know, there's a problem, there's a problem, there's a problem. Come on, can anybody come up with a solution? And I think it uh, dials down back to our psychology as well, because I think for, if I speak of, speak of my own, um, when we were brought up, we were given the fear of failure. That fear of failure is something that really holds us because we're so scared of being failed and fingers being pointed at us that we never attempt it. And I think uh, any problem can be solved by just not giving the idea of attempting it again and again till it gets solved out. So 2018, I go on Google. Now I start Googling out. You know, Google is my best friend at the end of the day. So I see how are people solving air pollution? And what comes to my mind, the data that I come over there are air purifiers. Now for Pakistan, a third world country uh, with the taxations and everything, um, uh, majority of the people are in, under more than 90% of people are in the lower middle class section. For them, importing these expensive air purifiers, that's uh, really not cost effective. So that is not happening. Now, a lot of people are not going to be able to uh, understand and why do they need an air purifier because it's so above their uh, salary scale. So what I do is um, I go online, I find other air purifiers, and then I, I land up at amazon.com. Now, once I land up at amazon.com, I see all these air purifiers that are listing. And then I look at the customer reviews. So we've got air purifiers, we've got customer reviews, and the customer is always right. What they're saying is, look, this is the problem over here. This is the problem over here. So you got a product, you got the problems. Now you fix it. That's what the fix it hacking mentality is. You take it, fix it, and then reiterate it. And that process went by, uh, we had market research in Pakistan. Uh, we went to different organizations. We went door to door. And uh, because by 2018, um, there's another international event that happened. And that's, again, the correlation. Finally, the world acknowledges there's a climate change and we need to do something about it. And the SDGs are coming in effect. So in short, I started with that. I kept moving forward one step at a time, one step at a time. And that is how Breathe I.O. was formed. And trust me, um, I was just working with my path on just developing an air purifier that is smart, that has artificial intelligence and machine learning in it. I had no idea that today I'll be standing in WSO, WSA and I'll be expressing how my story goes by and what has been over there. So in short, my last statement would be that, come on guys, if I can do it, I'm just a normal guy out of every one of you. And I find myself that it's very hard for me to focus and organize myself. Yet I meet other people that are so well organized and so well focused. I just believe so that if everybody can do that tempting thing once in their life, they can go far beyond me. So anything is possible once you put your mind to it. So thank you. Thank you, Mohammed. I will have so many questions to you, but thank you for sharing your amazing story, how you, you know, your journey to finding Brefayo. Um, we'll come back to your impact later. Um, but I just wanted to really echo, you know, what you have said that so many of WSA uh, community, they were really, as you said, I'm just a normal guy, just normal people who really saw a problem and just decided to act instead of waiting for somebody else to act. And it actually works all the time, almost all the time. 
So, so thanks, Mohamed, for reminding us that because it's very important that uh, we all can actually make a positive change. Thank you very much. I would like to um, ask Carlos and Pablo, uh, are you still with us, uh, to come online and to actually uh, share your uh, share your story with us as well. I know that Carlos, you have a presentation to share with us. So the floor is yours. So in the 2010s, most of Latin America burned, but literally. Protests took place in Mexico, Brazil, Argentina, Ecuador, Colombia, Peru. Many Latin Americans were tired of excessive inequality, corruption, informality, and poverty. The institutions had failed them. People were tired of not being heard, at least not by their regular channels. So they protested and unfortunately sometimes did it violently. We are from Chile and our country wasn't the exception. In October 2019, in Chile's capital, Santiago, an increase in our transportation fees made the bomb explode. People would burn the public transportation, both the underground and the city buses. And they even burned some churches for, for, of different religions, sorry, and also destroyed many, the many, small and medium businesses. Their anger was affecting others, people, right? Then the COVID arrived, 2020. People were locked in, but it's still angry. So it was a pretty bad combination. This scenario was, of course, grim and turbulent. In social meetings, at work, even at family dinners, you wouldn't talk about anything but violence, disagreement, and despair. Polarization became the rule, basically. So, of course, all the pollsters and analysts overcrowded the news and the talk shows and tried to figure out what was going on and what is going to happen, right? We had a, a new constitutional process in Chile going on because one of the protesters' claims was to replace Pinochet constitution. So it was very chaotic. By the time Paolo Veitia, my partner, and I were studying how Google searches allows us to predict people's behavior. So we were doing our PhDs, Paolo in Berlin in computational social sciences, I was doing mine in Italy, in political science, and we found out that when, when the queries about COVID peaked, people became more cautious around the world. They started looking the, whether face masks and washing your hands were effective in preventing the contagion, and they also started to going out less and less commuting decayed drastically. It was 2021 and the journey had begun, finally. That year, 2021, we tried to predict the constitutional referendum, our main concern in Chile, the, the outcomes, we failed. <laughs> but the same year, we had presidential elections, and this time we got it right. We were getting a more robust methodology. Pablo and I thought, okay, we have this. What comes now? We just started divulgating our predictions with our website, a Twitter account, even using WhatsApp, you know, your personal account. You don't have to hire a business account. or It's very simple, just a few characters an emoji, and that's it. So the media started paying attention to our predictions. We suddenly were giving weekly interviews about emerging social conflicts in Chile. Also media from Colombia, France, Spain, starting quoting our predictions. We gained confidence, and Carolina Rossi, one of the 
World Summit Awards juries convince us to apply for the World Summit Awards 2021. And guess what? We got in. In Quechua, Chile literally means the end of the world. The two of us from the end of the world were pitching our idea just with two connected laptops. That was it. To an international jury and social entrepreneurs from every corner of the world. It was amazing. It gave us a new boost, of course. So Pablo and I saw a business opportunity, right? Predictions are working. We drew an idea, pitched it, failed. But this year we tried again and we got in, we got accepted by Startup Chile, our public accelerator in Chile. By the way, any of you can apply to this program if you're willing to open a branch in Chile. It's a very good program, really. So now we have two clients. We offer them automated solutions, extracting data from Google searches, news media, YouTube, Spotify, Netflix, Twitter, almost every, every website or every web source, as you want to put it. These are companies, one is an energy company and the other one is a copper mining company. They are very worried about preventing and solving their conflicts with the local communities. So we offer them the solution to constantly monitor what happens in Chile and how to address the local communities now, not when you already have the mess in the zone, right? What's next? We have no idea, neither we did a year ago, honestly. But we did learn loads, and we want to share some of those lessons with you. First, be nice to everybody. This is your network. I mean, 15 years from now, these people can help you or your project thrive. Second, seize the crisis. It is a cliche, I know, but amongst the chaos, people will look for certainty. That's a science proved fact. So if from your expertise, you can provide just a little of certainty, you can make a huge impact. Third, Everybody has great ideas everywhere, every day. Make yours public, that's the difference. Anything you have, anything you make that you can share, do it, really. Sometimes you think that nobody cares about your content, but there is always at least one person looking for it. That one listener, one reader is your value. Embrace it. So let me ask you, are you being nice? Be nicer. What's your crisis? Find it, embrace it. And thirdly, are you ready to share your content? Even if you aren't, just do it. Trust me. Thank you, anyone. Thank you, Carlos. What a great story, how from a PhD, you went through such a crisis and completely reinventing probably, you know, the, the thoughts that you had when you entered the PhD. Um, and I guess this is like really also echoes to what Mohammed said, right? You can yeah. do it, really. So really nice to see that theme. But um, did you have any idea of what you wanted to do when you entered your PhD or Pablo? <laughs> well, we actually took very different courses from we kind of thought at the beginning, right? I was mm -hmm. more working for the government. Then Pablo started in sociology and finally ended up in digital social sciences. So we didn't know, but that's the idea, right? Just to start the road and it will open in several ways. You have to choose just in the middle of it. That's why the world is such a magical place. Yeah. <laughs> Let's Thank hear you. Yana, um, tell us her story, and then we will all come back again to uh, talk to each other and discuss what we've heard. 
Yes, thank you very, very much. First of all, I want to say I would not be here without my co-founder, Sige, um, who is not here today. But um, this is for me one of the most important lessons, and you'll see later why. Um, if you do not have a partner with the same values and also trust your intuition when you look for a co-founder, um, you will see if it matches and you will know it. From the moment you have your first meeting, the first 30 seconds, you know it. <laughs> and also, I wouldn't be here without our amazing developers developers who started or developed our app, um, our partner company Minds in Action in Wintook. Yes, so this is an interesting story because it also will yeah, remind you of whatever you do in life, even if you think, oh, this was a failure back then, it will lead you somewhere if you connect the dots at some point. So there's always something to learn. And I've, I will first start with you. Um, where my idea came from. So imagine I came to Namibia in 2015 for the first time. I'm from Germany. I'm now married to a Namibian living here. And I came here for an internship and I studied African studies as well. And now imagine Hans and Heidi who traveled to Namibia, who maybe did not study African studies like I did. They are from Germany and they belong to the largest group of non-African visitors in this country. And yes, it's their first visit to a Southern African country. Of course, they've heard about the genocide, the German colonial occupation in Namibia back in the days. And like 75% of all visitors in the country, they go on a self-drive tour. So they don't take a guide along. And yeah, they explore the country on their own. They're walking through Windhoek, they walk through Swakopmund, they drive, and they quickly realize that there are a lot of relics and monuments that look like they're in Germany. So obviously they expected that. This is all over the internet. This is in their, their guidebooks. But now there's actually no sufficient signage on monuments, be it from the German colonial era or from Namibia's long struggle of independence until 1990, where the last colony of Africa, Namibia, was actually freed and became their own independent country. So, um, yeah, we were trying to make history interesting and those stories accessible for people who are maybe not history geeks like me and Sitch, my co-founder. So I'm wondering now, Hans and Heidi, do they know that they are taking photos in front of the city skyline, which is beautiful, but now they're standing in the exact same spot where thousands of Herero and Nama were killed in a former concentration camp? Nobody knows because there is no signage. Would they still decide to take a photo in this exact same spot? Would they still smile? I'm not so sure. And Expo Radio Audio Guide Namibia is bridging this gap. We are delivering scientifically proven historical facts in a way of storytelling to enable mindful traveling in the country for tourists, but also for locals alike. And I'll explain to you just now why. Because my first idea was to just approach tourists and mainly German tourists. But we picked up that um, a lot of local uh, locals from various ethnic backgrounds also often do not know the full story of their past. And some people follow a strong colonial revisionist narrative. And yes, this circulates more among the German speaking tour guides. But on the other hand, some people are on the other side of the spectrum and they still blame every German person for the situation in Namibia um, that is happening today. And yes, both examples are very extreme but they exist among every other shade of gray in between. So in the past five years, from the moment that we had the idea to create an objective and factual narrative until today, some things have changed already, of course, but this is actually a positive thing for us. Because um, a lot of tourists that come now also want to learn more about it. They don't just come to go on a safari and see a giraffe. They want to get the whole mindful travel experience. And we kind of had this intuition before. <laughs> so um, on the other hand, also, it brought um, different problems because German media, while there was this genocide um, compensation um, debate on, brought a lot of stereotypical content and is just reproducing stereotypes while they actually think they are helping the debate. So yeah, we, we encounter both things and we try to solve this with Expo Radio and tell Namibia's story and genuine Namibian stories as well, because we believe that also history is, is a holistic thing. And oral tradition and storytelling in itself is deeply built in our human concept. And yes, not only in Africa, but especially here. Folk tapes tells are believed, folk tales are believed to have the power to hold the community together, the ancestors, the living, and even those not yet born. 
They serve to communicate morals and traditions to the young in preparation of life's obstacles. So based on this, we believe that actually sharing historical facts, cultural norms and knowledge even about the environment and nature. So we kind of broadened up our entire content and are really telling you everything about Namibia now. And this can increase cultural understanding and compassion and empathy while delivering relevant information. And this is really the vehicle to enable mindful traveling in Namibia, but also anywhere in the world. Let's have a look at today, where are we standing now? So we've created the first and only audio guide app for Namibia and a podcast with over 40,000 streams and counting. And when I first told people my idea, they were like, oh, that's crazy. How do you want to do a tech startup? But like we said before, we're all ordinary people, but maybe our minds work a bit differently. We connect the, uh, the dots a little bit differently and we dare. We just dare and try. You can always go back. Um, if it doesn't work or pivot, how we say in startup. So at the moment, we are adding also more um, products to the list because we came to realize in the past year that, yes, de despite having developed a tech product first, we are actually a startup that specialized in <laughs> storytelling. So we diversified our content and are currently creating our first audio book, working on our first ebook, which will later also become obviously a narrated audio book. We started actual live guided walking tours um, in Swakopmund in the coastal town, which has a lot, a lot of hidden history. While everyone always just thinks it's like a German town that they put here at the coast of Africa. But there is a lot of interesting um, things that you normally would walk past. So we, we provide a safe space for people. We want to have a discussion and explain and have questions being asked like this is always the most important thing we're not just telling we want to also listen to the questions of the people and then answer them for example in our podcast um, African folk tales for children as well not just in Africa but also abroad will also open up the mindset of young children to different cultural backgrounds and we're actually working also on a TV documentary series about Southern Africa that is completely different than most of the stuff that's actually right now out there in the Western media. So yeah, for me as one of the founders, it was very clear at some point that this startup is actually what I have been preparing for with all my experiences, skills and talents. Yet when I had the idea, I didn't know this. This is really a realization of maybe maybe a year ago when we actually won the World Summit Award, which was also our best achievement because this gave us so much, um, yeah, so much credentials that people actually say, oh, wow, uh, you are actually a business that people internationally recognize. So the idea is worth something. Um, I studied first acting, working as an actress in stage and film. And now if you say you want to start a tech startup, like <laughs> imagine the looks people give you. <laughs> also, the same happened when I said, oh, I'll maybe want to go back to university and study African studies, not to have like a different job. I was working as an actress, as a clown, like as a radio presenter, I did all the things. But I was like, hmm, if I read this stuff in any case on the internet, why not get a degree and read in university? <laughs> um, so this is actually what I can also just recommend. If you're interested in something, just get the degree because your your insight will be so much deeper. Um, yeah, I, w I went to Namibia. I worked here as a, um, as a radio presenter and I fell in love with the country, but I also realized very quickly that maybe a lot of very opinionated content on a German radio station here is not very welcomed by some locals. <laughs> so I decided, okay, let's pursue something else. I started teaching at a high school. I thought in Namibia, I can't continue with acting which was actually also wrong. I was wrong. I was here in movie productions um, while I did Expo Radio and we'll come now to my biggest learnings um, because we have a very lean startup approach. Um, never just, I would advise anyone, test your idea, but never give up everything that you have started. Because if I would not have, uh, if I would have stopped to narrate audiobooks produce voiceovers for other companies, I would have never had this idea to actually, and and the, the opportunity to start a publishing company as well, where we now can can basically feed all our Expo Radio content into it. Um, we're, to be honest, we're still not paying ourselves. And a lot of people are really finding that a bit weird. How can you win an international award, but not do this? And I have a very strong, um, 
yeah, like passion to really take this this unicorn startup idea away because people are so self-conscious. And even me, when I compare myself with other startups, I always think like, oh yeah, but we're not real. <laughs> but this is this is not true. So at the same time, there's there's always a narrative to both things. And we're experts in narratives. So you can either say, oh wow, you're going very slow. You don't have an investor. I can say, well, I own 100% of my own company and I don't have debt. How great is that? <laughs> and this can also be a good thing for a business. Um, I'm also a mom. <laughs> just hold on. Okay, I'm coming just now, darling. Oh, all right. Okay. <laughs> on the other hand, this is also another thing. And this is really such an important thing. I would have not stressed out now. Maybe four years ago, I did stress out about kids walking in or saying I have to take care of my kids. No. You have a startup, you're your own boss. Who says I have to work 12 hour shifts a day? No one. I work four hours on my startup. I work four hours on different jobs to have an income in between on weekends, in the evenings. Without my partner, it would not be possible, obviously. And yes, I take care of my kids. I'm also a mom and this is very important to me. So we do a lot of stuff ourselves. And I know, I think my time is probably g going up, but um, I want to say there's a lot of stuff you can do yourself. And before you go and hire an expert for something, know what your, the expert does. You don't need to know how the expert does it. That's the expert's job. But I want to know what they do and I want to speak with them. This is why we're learning everything on the go. And I will only hire a professional co podcast marketing company once I know what they have to do, all the steps involved. And this is just an example. Same with the app. I don't need to know how to code an app, but I need to know how to speak to a developer. And then any creative can become anything with the help of people. So right now, Sitch and I both work other jobs, but we're so passionate and we will we will continue. We have great feedback from other people. And um, we're, we're currently improving the app amongst a lot of other things. And I must really say the World Summit Award winning this, this was really incredibly important to us because it gives us really this credibility and we're growing our audience. We're improving the app. We're creating content on a daily basis. And I calculated today to, to wrap it up. We have over a thousand minutes of edited audio material and we are creating a big team of locals and abroad also. Thanks for digital, a, a digital working environment. So one day we will add a happily ever after to our story. Thank you very much. Thank you, Jana. <laughs> it is a very <laughs> wonderful story. And thank you for being so open, you know, what it, what it is actually to be a working mom, building your own company, then you don't get so much support. And I think that we will definitely come back to this uh, part of the discussion uh, because it is so important to address that and that more entrepreneurs who are building startups would feel just like you. We don't need to chase the unicorns. We are doing this because we care, because we want to and want to do it our own way. So this is like really, really great. Thanks so much for sharing. And I have a question from the audience for you, actually. Um, are you planning to move to other countries? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, in the beginning, I still remember um, I had we had. I won um, a Femtech award, which was that 2011, uh, 11, tw 2021. <laughs> I'm like, my math is also not good. I hire an expert for that. <laughs> uh, <laughs> so yes, and we were, had this big five year plan. Yes, in five years, we'll be in like Zimbabwe, all the other self-drive countries, Botswana, South Africa. And now we realize, okay, yes, this would have been possible if we had a big investor work 12 hour days from day one. I believe still this is possible to move to other countries. Um, the concept is there. We have all the guidelines. We could even hire teams if there is an investor to, who wants to do this in another country. We wouldn't even need to be involved. We could advise and have a share in the company, for example. But um, I also believe you have to live in a certain country, really. I couldn't do all of this without Sij, my Namibian um, co-founder, 100% not, even if I studied African studies and I live here now. And everything I've learned in the past six years that I lived here is very different from where I came from six years ago also. I mean, the world is changing. Maybe everybody can join to, the, to this discussion because I think it's very interesting topic to continue about, you know, uh, building your company the way you want to versus the way somebody else is directing. Because what um, I think uh, I think I've heard recently a lot 
that, you know, not necessarily inviting investors to be able to do what you want. And for example, not to move in another country if you don't feel like it and not to work 12 hour days is becoming a, a, a way for startups, at least uh, to some startups. Um, Carlos, Mohamed, if you're still there, Pablo, um, if you have an opinion on that, what is your take? How do you manage your business in that regard? Mohamed, do you want to go? <laughs> sure, um, you can go first. I was waiting for you, you know, oblige people, you know, be nicer. <laughs> like <you said. laughs> Thank you so much. Um, I actually agree with Diana. I I like being involved in several projects. I think it's refreshing. It also gives you some perspective about your main business because you know you have all the sectors have have problems. Yours are not bigger, not smaller, just problems to be solved. And I've found many solutions to my main job by doing stuff in other sectors that are, are not apparently related. But at the end, everything is connected. So, Carlos, are you planning to maybe source funding uh, or are you also taking a different approach to building your business? We are, no, we are now trying to grow through sales. Selling, because we have a subscription model. So it's very easy to scale up, but we need a very strong base of clients, right? I think in my case it's a little different than Yana's and Mohammed because ours is now a business, like a corporate business, trying to keep the impact we had at the beginning. But it's a different formula, I think. Yeah, but it's that discovery of those differences and changes, right? What keeps you actually still Absolutely. making the impact. And I know that we're talking about business now, but we will also come back to the impact as a next topic. But Mohammed, maybe you can um, uh, comment on your approach to building your business. Are you trying to fund it? Are you doing it through uh, your own uh, means? Um, what is your perspective? Because I know that you're also selling brief, uh, your devices and, and making a corporate business, as Carla said. Um, how do you manage it? Um, so I, I just uh, take in my opinion towards that is uh, uh, for me, uh, what I would say again, for me, you know, the opinion is mine. I own it 100%, you know, 120%. So I think you've got to keep a balance. Um, you need the funding for the company to sustain. And the funding is only applicable if, you, if you're able to sell it. So, I mean, it doesn't work. Uh, I always correlate, you know, when you listen to other stories, um, there was a story about pet rock. Everybody should know about that. How a person took rocks, gave it a shape, put it in a box, and became a million dollar business in one year. So if that can sell, anything else can sell as well. So I would say um, for all people that are listening, they come up with an idea, sell it. You know, as a startup, you have a perfect space. You have the perfect comfort zone. You're not a corporate company. You're in the process of becoming a corporate company. So when people buy stuff from startups, they give you the leverage of, you know, error and margin are right over there. So if it doesn't work in some contexts, they won't come to your callers for that. It's a startup. They, it's supposed to have a user feedback. You know why, Um, in my opinion, I don't, uh, personally, nobody likes to communicate with corporate companies. Why? Because they don't listen. They've got so many layers in between them, salesperson, live chat, so and so forth. But why do people, I think the psychology is, uh, you know, you love talking to the founder because, you know, your opinion matters. And when you say something, they might do it. And you'll see the iteration in the in the device. For instance, um, with my device, um, uh, I've met so many of my customers and talked to them. How does my device make you feel? Is there any difference? Um, most of my ideas, I would say 70% of the iterations in my device are not my ideas. They're my customer feedback. They told they told me, look, this is what we should we, we want in the device. And I did it in accordance to it. So the balance uh in between the impact, the impact has to be there. You know, it has to add the value. If my product is not value adding value to the customer, or instance, I mean, if I launch something 
if I start communicating with the customer, they're going to make sure I add the value to it. And yes, the funding has to be there and you need to scale up. You need to scale up because they look at that. I, I would, I would uh, resonate with Carlos. I used to also think on this 8 billion people, 8 billion people. That's a lot of the world. If you could just capture 1%, 1%, 1% of 8 billion, you know, you're almost halfway to the unicorn. 1%. Nothing. Let, let's make it down. 0.5%. 0.5%, you're almost halfway to, the, to becoming a unicorn. So, yes, I always say that, uh, you know, fundraising is not hard. It's It just seems very hard. The first check seems very hard. But trust me, there is so much, so many VCs around the world that are looking for you. You just got to go out there, tell people about yourself. At least... Tell 200 people in a year about yourself. You should meet 200 different new people. So I would include these six people right over here. Add it to my list. Okay. <laughs> Another couple of numbers going forward. So that's my opinion on that. I think it's, um, you know, I hear a bit of a different approach towards, let's say, finding investors or wanting to attract funding. And I want to share that, you know, since I came to the WSA, I saw a transition in terms of, in general, uh, social impact and finance. In 2015, when I first went to Singapore to the Congress, it was like uh, two separate camps that cannot live together. It was like, no, the social business is made by NGOs, by nonprofits. There is no kind of self-sustaining business model. It cannot ex coexist. In 2018, there was a lot of discussion of like, Hmm, but if we don't have a business model and if we don't charge, how we will survive and continue making our impact. <laughs> so there was a lot of that. And I think that like today we are on a completely different end of a spectrum compared to 2016, where companies really are seeking to have a, at least a business model, not necessarily investment, uh, not necessarily actively fundraising from VCs, um, but at least a business model that actually allows to sustain that impact. Um, so I think that it's very important and very uh, great to hear that you're you know, on that part of the table, which is already thinking about how to sustain your business to actually continue making the impact. Just and, want to quickly add one thing. Sorry to cut you off. No worries. I mean, at every day, there are more and more people dying than actually people being born on this place. So if we're running out of humans, who are we going to like, how are we going to sustain? So the sustainability element has to be there. The maths and the equation says for it. If there are no humans, what are we going to do? <laughs> well, with the 8 billion just recently, I guess we're not really close to that problem. <laughs> <laughs> and growing, <laughs> lucky to us. Hmm. Um, but coming back to the impact, um, you are doing such different, uh, you know, making such different impact by doing such different things. Um, I just want to ask you, did you uh, think impact first? Did you consciously realize that you're solving SDGs, that you're being part of that like bigger picture of how to improve the world? Or did you just saw the problem and you, you know, rolled your sleeves up and started doing something about it? Um, maybe Yana, you would like to comment. Yeah, it's it's very interesting to think about it because in the beginning, like I had a different podcast before and did a bit of blogging. Oh, this is I'm moving to Namibia now. This is my perspective. And at some point I thought, OK, I actually don't have time to do this if I'm not getting paid for this. And then I thought, I thought I learned now um, apps actually don't make you a millionaire <laughs> immediately anymore. <laughs> Um, they can, but um, I, the first thing after I had this idea was like, oh, cool, this is the perfect package for my product where I can sell immediately. But five years ago, podcast subscriptions are also were also new or rare, like they've only been implemented in the past two years or and even not to perfection, like we still struggle a lot with it. And that's actually another learning I want to share. If your location is Namibia and you like, I can luckily sometimes set something up in Germany and then this is all working, but Apple or Spotify are sometimes like, ah, sorry, we don't like your country. <laughs> so this is actually a very big problem for people that have great ideas here and you need partners also. Um, but yeah, I think I was trying to find something to get paid for what I like doing or while I'm doing it, but 
I started it in a way I could have started it smarter as a business because I think there was this nagging thought in my head. Yeah, if I have 25 listeners, that's nice. <laughs> and then I didn't set it up like a business in the beginning. And then it, I, I compared a lot to gardening. Then you have to like take out all the weeds for a long time where you didn't set up in the beginning perfectly to monetize it. So and then to reach the next step to be ready for an investor, for example, would be for us next year, probably. Yeah. Yeah. What about you, Carlos? I know that you have to run uh, in a few minutes to pick up your kid because we ran over a bit with the technical issues at the beginning, but maybe you can uh, elaborate on this point. Before yeah, actually, I we started in a very random way because Paolo was studying this phenomenon, this how, how did Google and Wikipedia help you to predict real world facts? So he showed me, we are best friends since we're seven from school. And he showed me because he was very fascinated with this, like, oh, look what I did. It's beautiful. It's amazing. It's super fun. I agreed with him, but I told him, this is real. I mean, you have something here. And that's how we started. But it wasn't a business. It was just fun <laughs> then we we started with the we matched it with the problem that was happening in latin america in our country and we said at the beginning let's see how this goes for now let's have some impact because it's free i mean it is free you don't need any paid subscription just maybe some linkedin you can make a Google site in two minutes. And you just have to be really, but really, but really consistent until you became nauseous about posting and writing and looking for some new ways of copywriting or sharing. It is very tiring, but after months doing it, in impact will come. If you have something interested interesting to tell that's another thing nobody cares about you your project your product everybody cares about my problem what i'm feeling what are my expectations so please just communicate to that right nobody cares about how beautiful or great you are solving things what is that's the pain that you are helping to solve that's a bit controversial to what you said as your third advice of somebody cares about your content. <laughs> yeah, but, but because you, you can but relate to them. Yeah. Because you can relate to their pain. Absolutely. Or to their situation or to. Yeah. Absolutely. And again, as Mohammed said, we are 8 billion. At least <laughs> one of them will look for your content. Or yeah, hopefully 0.5%. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> I guess, Yana, the being persistent with uh, doing it, showing up and actually doing the work is really probably resonates with you because it is very important for you to continuously put out the content, put out and do it, right? Yeah. It's actually interesting. Something happened this year where we were like, Sitch started a new job at a school and we were like, okay, I got very sick, um, but I'm good again. And then we couldn't post for a while and didn't do things. And we didn't have interns at that time. We didn't have freelancers that we could or wanted to pay. Um, and then I realized, oh, but our content is still out there. And our streams went up, 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 up. And I could see every time the German had like school holidays, up, 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 up. And then I was like, okay, we probably have enough for it to be like a little bit self-sustainable. And we still create like numbers while we're not working. And this was for me a very enlightening moment where I think you, you break through this one threshold at some point, but you also need to, as I said, garden and weed and make your content still look nice. And then I realized ugh, some, some of those audio clips on Spotify have still covers from like five years ago when I didn't know how to make a nice cover. Let's, let's change that. And I think that's a very important lesson as well. Sometimes you think you always have to go faster, better and new and innovate, but maybe give it some time. People find you and, and fall in love with it. Yeah. 
Mohamed, it's I guess a bit different for you because sorry, you guys. Actually, oh, sorry. Really nice to meet you, Mohamed and Diana. Thank Thanks you for joining us and sorry for the delay. Bye. All the best. Bye, guys. Okay. Um, bye. So, Mohamed, I guess you were in hospitals where you saw from data the problem that children were having. When you went for finding the breath bio and actually looking for those filters, you knew exactly that you're making social impact and saving lives. Um, okay, I'm going to just attach another storyline to this as well. So that's going to like add in the spice and more interest to it. <laughs> so that happened somewhere in 2016. Um, um, looking at that, uh, while looking at observing at children, you know, in third world countries, the biggest problem is uh, whenever you need blood, you know, for surgeries and shortage of blood, fresh blood is never available. It's always storage and the right blood group is never accessible to the people. And it always a ha hassle. Okay, so I'm my, my blood group is A positive and uh, other blood groups. So when everybody, because over here in Pakistan, there are these WhatsApp groups, social media groups, and everybody, every time they need a, they need blood. So the contacts and everything, it goes by over there. So what I did was I formalized all that thing in an app and uh, I called it uh, Blood Billions of Geo Blood and I presented it at the Vision Conference. So now what you have an app is it's geotagging blood donors all around in your area. So you put uh, a pointer, 2.5 kilometer radius, and it finds you people living in blood area, which group, which blood group person is right close to your area. So now this was purely a social impact thing. This was purely in collision conference. And there was this one guy that came, uh, that happened in New, New Orleans, and he came to me and he's like, now again, user feedback. Dude, I'm going to use your app. I'm going to move into a neighborhood where there are more blood donors. And I'm like, why? Because the neighborhood seems more helping, more kind, more supportive. Okay. So I'm like, okay, that's interesting. Now, the problem with that app was it didn't have no business model. It was completely set out for a social impact. And at Collision Conference, everybody appreciated for what I've done. But the, when the investors came over here, I had no way to sustain it. You know, my sustainability business model was, I'm going to collect the data later on. We can give the data and the universities can use it for research and so on and so forth. But anyhow, so I think that was perfect social impact. It still needs, there's room and space for that as well over there. But, but because it didn't have a business model over there, it couldn't sustain. And that's where the whole philosophy the understanding, the learning of uh, that app came into Breathe.io. I need to have that social impact without which it's, there's not going to be a demand for it. But I need a way to sustain it. Okay. And then the other part comes in. Um, it, it was again in uh, OpenGSV, these conference events going on. There was this guy. He did it. He said a really beautiful thing. You know, start making people's dream come true. Somewhere in between your dreams are going to come true as well. And everybody needs to find their personal and professional purpose. And it's really easy. For instance, I didn't know my personal purpose. I just needed words to define it. I was doing it instinctively. So my personal purpose purpose is to, I want to achieve immortality. You know, our bodies cannot achieve immortality, but I want to achieve immortality. And the only way I found out was, I just need to create history. I need a way that history should remember me. And I've achieved immortality right over there. And that's my pers personal purpose. So the social impact overweighs right over here. To achieve, to create history so everybody remembers whether I live or not, I need to do something that's going to help make people's life better or at least save them. And that's where my personal purpose comes in. To create products that promote the well-being and longevity of human life on Earth. So I think uh, these are the school of thoughts that kind of align uh, and help me, uh, I mean, initially move with the social impact, but add the business model to it as well. <laughs> Through learning and also reinventing yourself, what we heard a lot today, uh, I guess, uh, from everybody really. But also what I'm very curious now, you know, um, especially Mohammed, maybe you can start to answer this question. Um, do you have a lot of people in your network? Do you have people... Uh, that you know, I don't know, from your school, from your university, from your local neighborhood, you know, in your in your close circle, 
who think like that, that social impact is in their DNA, that they have to, like whatever they do, it has to address some issues of humanity. Um, are you surrounded with those people or is it a one-off case and you feel lonely wolf in that, <laughs> in the world? <laughs> What do you want? To, what do you want me to say? You want to lie, or you want the truth? <laughs> the truth. Only truth. <laughs> um, the truth is that uh, um, as of what technology has submerged into our life, we have evolved to a point that uh, we've evolved with technology. Now you can't live without technology, and without technology, you know, you can't live without your smartphones. Okay, but uh, I've seen the era where there was no smartphones. I just find it was more peaceful. Communication had a meaning. You know, people had a meaning. Every time somebody used to come to your house, a random bell used to rang. We used to get excited for somebody at our house. Nowadays, it's like the, the bell rings, even if it's like 3 p.m., 4 p.m., or like 12, <laughs> 1 p.m. I'm like, every the perspective is like, yo, what the hell? Only call before coming, okay? So I think... Uh, uh, what technology has done is we've uh, we've had communication so easy we take it granted for granted and we're too much connected with each other and that adds a disconnect part as well we need everybody needs that space in which they can at least have time to organize myself uh, organize themselves so when regards to social impacts i've seen people um not exactly with my school of thought but definitely they are moving towards that scape as well and then SDGs, you know, and the business aspect, the funding coming to it. So that's promoting the social impact a lot. Because if this won't, uh, the SDGs won't, and the trends won't come, um, as of now, like 51% investments are happening in sustainability. And 49% investments worldwide by VCs are happening in health tech. Okay, so until as this trend doesn't keep moving over here, you know, the sustainability and the social impact part would not survive so far. So that's my perspective. Hope that makes sense. It does make sense a lot. And you know, like we're talking about the local context, right? So it's very important, interesting for me, at least personally, to understand what is that local context, uh, like according to these topics. So for example, in Namibia, Jana, uh, is social impact a thing? Is UN SDGs a thing? Do people think that then they are starting their business or then they are doing projects? Yeah, a lot. There was actually another winner in 2022 from Namibia and they've created, I think, a huge impact was Jabu. And yeah, it, it's very, um, I would say people think differently here. It's first like, how can I make the place for the community better? And I think if you live life like that, it's very healthy. <laughs> I, I was also thinking in a way, maybe not everyone is into doing an NGO or a social impact business, but I have a lot of happy people in my network and happy people want other people to be happy and they're not jealous and they're helping and they're giving hands to each other. And it doesn't matter how small or big the step is. It doesn't matter if you help your domestic worker here to bake bread at your house that she can sell because she doesn't have an oven or electricity. It's really just this, how can I help? I think a lot of people in Namibia have this uh, mindset. Yeah. How can I help? If you saw the Netflix series about living to 100, it's all about that, really. Like long. I actually long, haven't gotten that yeah, far, but maybe I must. <laughs> maybe we must continue watching it. <laughs> but that's, I guess, one of the key insights. So it's very good to hear that around the world, people are doing that. What about Chile, Pablo? Um, is social impact a thing in Chile? Yeah, I think it's a common things. Um, most of of people of young people or in the at the university are, are trying to do things like that uh, supporting people for example in the slums uh, or informal settlements uh, or very poor people in latin america yeah um one of my first jobs was in the ngo techo which is trying to give um, um um, a house to everyone in Latin America, yeah, and I think that, that in that context, I I uh, met a lot of young people in all over Latin America trying to do something um, in different aspects, and I think the the NGOs 
um, are a good environment uh, to create, to innovate, or that was my, my experience uh, in Chile. So we were creating some technologies, for example, a monitor of um, slums or informal settlements in Latin America. And I think that project was probably the 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 uh, previous the, the previous version of monitor social yeah because we were monitoring social aspects in Chile or the growing of the housing uh, social housing in, in Chile that was a, a really good experience and I think there are a lot of people trying to do similar things. Thank you Pablo. And I know that we're like closing to, uh, well, over an hour for us, but for the video <laughs> to an hour. So we should close. And I would just um, kind of really like to, you know, it gives me goosebumps to hearing stories from across the world. And that's why I really, really recommend. I know that you couldn't come to Mexico for a global Congress, but if you get a chance to join another uh, WSA event, I really encourage you to join because really it's all about, you know, those, local context, the stories from around the world and people, as again, Mohammed said, just a regular guy, <laughs> actually, you know, doing a positive change. But um, maybe so uh, just for the end, uh, I know that you already gave a lot of different advices, but um, if you could give an advice to, you know, five, like, let's say 10 years um, ago yourself, if you are giving, sending a, a time message to yourself in 10 years ago, what would that advice be? Um, who, who would like to volunteer to go first? I'll go first, I'll go Please. first. So if I like travel 10 years back and I meet myself, so what I'm gonna say, I've just got 30 seconds. You know, I run the simulation a lot as also. So what I'd say to myself is, um, look, people are gonna reject you and your ideas. Don't give up on that. Just keep steady, keep fast, and one day you'll realize what you are. So don't listen to people. Just listen to yourself, listen to your heart. That's the truth, and in time you're going to know it. Amazing. Thank you. <laughs> Yana, are you ready? I see you're leaning forward. Uh, yeah. Um, I don't know. Yeah, if, if it's a message to myself, but maybe it's just a general message. But I think the most important part, be it startup or doing any other career or social impact, having an impact, helping people, you always need to find this right balance between being realistic, but don't stop dreaming. And if you get this right, you can get anywhere. Awesome. I hope that a lot of people will take it in. <laughs> Yeah, I have to go also now and be realistic and take care of my kids. <laughs> Bye. Well, Pablo, over to you. <laughs> Bye, Anna. Very nice to meet you. <laughs> okay, I, I would say um, you just need to do fun things, but be persistent. Yeah, and keep going to do fun things. Yeah, because you need mo motivation. I think that that is one of the most relevant things. Motivations. Um be persistent. <laughs> what a nice way to wrap up. Persistency, motivation, keep on dreaming and listen to your gut, listen to yourself and not other people. Thank you so much. Uh, sorry that it has been like a bit of a juggle of technology today, but I hope that you enjoyed talking to each other and getting to know each other. I hope that the audience who's listening to this will find the stories also very interesting and inspiring and useful. I'm sure you can uh, go to WSA LinkedIn and find all the speakers of today, all of their projects um, in the post about IX3 event. If you want to follow them, if you want to share your uh, congratulations or send uh, wishes or just in general have any advice or suggestions, please go ahead and get in touch. And um, I am really looking forward to seeing you guys in a WSA event, a physical event, hopefully. And I'm really looking forward to meeting the audience again on another IX3 event where we will share stories how insight, impact, uh, inspiration, impact is changing the world. Thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Audrey. Thank you, Bye-bye. Bye-bye.